Great to be here this morning. Certainly good to see Rick and Kathy Boswell worshiping with us. They're on their way to the Outer Banks for a vacation. And uh, I think I went to Florida College with Kathy and met uh, Rick when I first moved up to Northwest Indiana, where I, my first work was in a training program with John Brewer, who preached in the uh, Highland Street Church in Hammond. And it's certainly great to see that they're both from very strong Christian families in that part of the country. And it's good to see them again. I want to begin by asking Josh if he would fill us up with water. Let it run until it gets very hot. Fill it about halfway up. I feel a, a scratchy throat coming on. I may need that. And uh, let me get my lesson put on the uh, PowerPoint here. We're going to continue with the lesson that we began two weeks ago. I think this is the third lesson in the, the series that is entitled Fightings Within the Church in Corinth. We talked last week, and by the way, the outline or summary of the, of the uh, lesson today is in the bulletin. And do we have any among our numbers that need a copy of the bulletin so you can follow along? Al, would you please come over here and get the bulletins on the second pew? I gave them to John Wyman, but he disappeared. <laughs> They're down here, Robert. Pass those out to uh, the ones that have their hands raised. That way it'll make it a little bit easier for to follow along in the lesson. And I was beginning to point out, last week we considered 1 Corinthians, the problem of carnality as it existed in the church in Corinth. And their carnality was seen in three different ways, primarily. Actually, every problem that they had was to one extent or another based on carnality. But this particular aspect of their carnality was seen in their uh, boasting of men such as Paul and Cephas and Apollos, above that of Christ. They were putting one man above another. Thank you. And the Apostle Paul reprimands them for that. They were corrected because of the vision that was caused in the church there, because of their boasting of one man or another, rather than boasting in Christ. Their carnality was also seen in the fact that they were emphasizing human wisdom and human knowledge over that of God. And the knowledge of God is seen in His Word. The chapter 1, verses 26 through 27 points out. Their carnality was also seen in the fact that they were causing divisions also as they were setting up class distinctions among the brethren there. The rich, the poor, maybe were a class distinction. And different, uh, the intelligent, maybe more educated against those who are not so highly educated. So those were the ways in which they expressed their carnality of sin, which they were guilty of in many different ways. We also pointed out in the previous lesson the immorality. Again, this was a, an expression of their carnality, but it's a sin that was seen in the fact that we had a member of the church there that was living with his father's wife. And we went into some detail about how that may have uh, been brought out within that particular case. But the problem was not so much the immorality, although it was a problem in and of itself, but they were guilty of not solving the problem in the correct way. They did not solve these problems. They did not handle the problems. They did not respond to the problems of carnality or the problems of immorality in the correct way. The church there, instead of being shamed and mourning about the brother who's living in sin, they were boasting, they were puffed up about it. For some reason, that's beyond my understanding, but they were puffed up and boasting about that unfortunate situation. Then we went on to point out the contentions that existed in the church there. Chapter 6 points this out. As they were contentious to the extent 
that they were suing one another in courts of law, rather than handling their problems within the church. Paul, again, they had obviously a problem behind this situation where one brother was probably harmed or maybe cost some money or some property was stolen from you. Who knows what the specific uh, offense was in the first place? But again, Paul directs his attention on how they responded to that initial sin where one brother was offended by another. Instead of handling it within the church by appointing one person among them, even the least esteemed, as Paul said, to arbitrate and mediate that problem, they were taking one another to court. And Paul said it would even be better if you would, uh, instead of going to court, you suffer a wrong. Allow yourself to be wronged by your brother rather than shame the church by taking your problem in front of the community, in front of the, the civil courts. So they were contentious. And uh, Paul also points out in that context that as Christians, we're going to be judging the world. We are the, going to be judges of the unrighteous. I don't know exactly how our judgment of the unrighteous is to be expressed, but in some way or another, we're going to be with Christ in judging the unrighteous world. So why are then they then taking their problems to the world to be judged when just the opposite should have been true? So they were contentious among themselves. And that was another fighting within the church in Corinth. We also noticed the marriage issues in chapter 7 and the entire chapter there. The marriage issues included the mutual and reciprocal sexual relationship between husband and wife, verses 3 and 5. He talked about whether it was better or more wise to remain single or to get married. And he talked about the problem of mixed marriages. A mixed marriage being the marriage of a Christian and a non-Christian. And he points out instructions to the Christians and how to deal with all those difficult challenges and those questions that needed to be answered, those situations that needed to be faced. Then we talked about the issue of Christian liberty, chapters 8 and also in chapter 10. In the church there in Corinth, they lived in a town, in a city, a major city, that was uh, corrupted by paganism. And in the, in the pagan worship, they would offer certain meats, sacrificing animals. And then those meats would be eaten as part of a ritual, pagan ritual of worship. And then sometimes those meats would then be taken to the marketplace and sold. Some Christians thought it was perfectly fine to eat that meat in the marketplace, and those are the ones who had knowledge, as opposed to those who were more conscientious about those meats, who had probably been brought up eating those very same type of meats in their pagan worship, and there was no way that they were going to eat those meats with a clear conscience. So Paul says that Christians who have the knowledge that those eating of those meats is right, such as 1 Timothy 4 and verse 4, uh, as the Bible teaches us, they were to acquiesce to the weaker members and refuse to offend their conscience and cause them to sin by eating those meats in their presence. And he tells us then how to handle our Christian liberties, whatever they might be. We sort of take from all of these situations, the carnality, the immorality, the contentions, the marriage issues, the Christian liberty, issues all to heart because they can affect us as well. We also talked about, well, I guess this is a new one. We're going to talk today about the issue of paying the preacher. This was a problem with the church in Corinth. As it is in some other churches, it has been one extent or another over the centuries. But before we continue talking about this particular subject, let me point out something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. As he writes to the church in Corinth about their fightings within, the problems and issues that plagued that church, he says to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. He's writing this not just to the church in Corinth, but to those Christians and those churches in every place who call on the name of Jesus our Lord. So these are problems that Paul recognized could have affected the church not just in Corinth, and not just churches in the first century, but churches in all places for all time. 
And they afflict churches today as well. So as we go through all these different examples of the plagues or the fightings and the turmoil that plagued the church of Corinth, let's realize that these could be our problems in many cases they are. We have to solve them based on the same principles that the Apostle Paul initiated as he was uh, solving their problems uh, in the letters of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Paying the preacher. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 27 of 1 Corinthians is a text where we turn to here. And the first uh, 13 verses, or maybe 18 verses in this chapter, the Apostle Paul goes back to the history of God's ancient people. The, the, uh, the Old Testament nation of Israel. And point out from the time that they left the nation of Egypt, they were plagued with temptations of one sort or another. They had temptations to disobey God. They were tempted to become disobedient. They were tempted to rebel. They were tempted to go into immorality. They were tempted with lust. They were tempted with uh, uh, idolatry. Any number of temptations that we face yet today, they face. And he uses them as an example. And in those temptations, there was a way of escape, just like there is for us today. But they were not looking for the way of escape. And they ended up being punished by God because of their unfaithfulness, seeing so many different ways. And God punished them by forcing them to stay 40 years in the wilderness, wandering around until the one generation passed away. But he uses them as an example of uh, <coughs> I, uh, I skipped, I think I skipped uh, a point here. I'm talking about Pain and Preaching chapter 9 and I sort of segued over into uh, chapter 10 in reference to temptations. Let's go back to chapter 9. And I apologize for that. Uh, my mind just slipped the gear there. But as we uh, transition into chapter 9, we see a certain behavior, a pattern of behavior that the Apostle Paul expressed throughout his life. When he was willing to serve God selflessly, to give himself to churches selflessly, to make sure that his work was one that put Christ first, and put the churches first, and put the faithfulness and the strength and the spiritual growth of every Christian first. The Apostle Paul, for example, forwent certain rights that he had as a Christian. In uh, chapter 1 and verse 14, he points out that he did not baptize very many. Now apparently baptizing people was a, a, a source of pride for some of the preachers and a source of glory for some of the members who were baptized by either Paul or Apollos or Cephas. But Paul said he was grateful he did not baptize very many except the household of Gaius and uh, a few others. So he forewent for whatever glory may have come from that, which would have been misplaced, even though, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, it would have been wrong. Uh, to uh, have glorified and baptized with somebody. In chapter 7 and verse 9, Paul refused to marry. He said, you should, can be like me during this present distress of persecution. And it would be better not to marry. He forwent the blessing of marrying in order to preach the gospel and put the gospel of Christ and the salvation of people's souls first. He thought being married apparently would have put a burden upon him that would have interfered with the preaching of the gospel. So he uh, was willing to forego that blessing and that right and that privilege. Chapter 8 and verse 13, he would not eat certain foods among those Christians who were conscientious about eating foods and being sacrificed to idols. So he, he was willing to forego that right as well. And uh, here in chapter 9, when it comes to being paid by the local church, he was willing to forego being supported by the church in Corinth. He did the same thing when he was in Thessalonica. The church in Philippi supported him on more than one occasion when he was preaching in Thessalonica. And here in Corinth, he was uh, foregoing that 
support from them as well because he did not want to burden them. He recognized in this context the right for a preacher to be supported by the church. And it brings forth this uh, universal principle of, uh, of uh, so reaping and sowing that a farmer should be allowed to eat and prosper personally from the plants that he grows. The uh, shepherd should be able to drink from the milk of the sheep or whatever, and the uh, uh, worker should not be denied benefits from his work. The priests in the Old Testament, they were supported by the offerings made as they served in the temple and at the altar. So the Apostle Paul points out that these are some important principles that apply to the pay and the support of preachers as well. And as we mentioned, Paul often supported himself. He appealed back to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 4 in reference to do not uh, uh, deny grain from the, uh, the oxen that was uh, treading out the corn. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 14 beginning, he talks about how the church in Philippi had supported him when he was in Thessalonica. And he was not taking support from the church in Corinth as well. In uh, Acts chapter 18, the Apostle Paul points out, as he was staying with Aquila and Priscilla, who were all tent makers, that he supported himself while he was in Corinth, the very church to whom he writes this letter. Not only that, but Paul, as Acts chapter 18 verse 3 points out, supported other preachers, his co-workers, he supported as well as himself. So the preacher has a right to be supported by the church. The idea that uh, if you take a look there in our first, in our first Corinthians chapter 9, it says that we have no right to eat and drink. Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? And then he talks about the need in verse 7. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen that he is concerned about? No, Paul says. Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This it is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope to be partaker of his hope. If we have shown some spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? That's the crux of the matter right there, the verse that nails what Paul is speaking about. He was sowing spiritual things among the church there, within the brethren. And it's expected that they the preachers will reach material things that is financial support from the church. So Paul recognized he had a right to receive spiritual or material things in the church that he was imparting spiritual blessings to. Why didn't he do that? That's part of the gospel. It was part of the gospel to preach, and if Paul was going to preach the full gospel, why would he refrain from preaching that part of the gospel? He should also tell them that you should not only uh, be baptized for the remission of sins, obey the Lord in all areas, but you should also support the preacher. That's part of the gospel, and indeed it is. So why didn't Paul do that right up front? Well, because preaching of the gospel has different purposes. His preaching, in this case, had two purposes. One was to teach the church there that they needed to support the preacher. And of course, he eventually did that in this letter that he wrote. He didn't do it while he was preaching there in Corinth, in person, but he did it in the letter. He did teach them that eventually. But the second reason that plays into this issue for the gospel being preached is that people might be saved. So Paul had a decision to make. Am I going to right up front tell them they need to support me financially and put that first? Or am I going to teach them the gospel so they might be saved? And that was where Paul came down on this issue. 
He decided it was more important to preach that purpose of the gospel, which is intended to save people from their sins, to make Christians and disciples of Christ out of them, and keep them faithful in the Lord's church. That was more important to him than being paid. So he put that first. He for went this right to be supported by the church there for the purpose of making sure that nothing he did would be offensive to them. There may very well have been members of the church there who thought, well, if he comes here preaching for money, well, that's all he's all about. He's just a, a hireling. He's preaching for money. If he talks about the need to support him as a preacher, uh, they might say that he's preaching for money. He did not want that to happen. So he put the most important purpose of preaching, saving souls ahead of the equally scriptural rights of the preacher to be supported by the church. Now let's move on to the next uh, problem that the church had there. And uh, I left it out of my outline. It's supposed to be the one that I talked about a minute ago. The problem was temptation. That he talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 13. And in this context, as I mentioned previously, he uses the ancient Israelites, the nation of God in the Old Testament, as an example of the temptation that they faced, but failed to overcome. They did not overcome the temptations that came their way. They ended up being rebellious against God, and as a result, God punished them severely for their rebellion and disobedience. In verse 13 of this chapter, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear. So that's the lesson from the Old Testament and the lesson that Paul is teaching here in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. There is a temptation that we all face. We need to be ready for them and prepared to overcome them. God's going to provide a way of escape from temptations. We have to be willing to find that way of escape. Temptation is a universal problem. Everybody's tempted. Everyone that's ever lived in the face of this earth has been tempted by Satan. Yet many people don't recognize that. Sometimes a preacher or an elder will go up to a person with a particular problem who's, who has, has succumbed to a temptation and they'll say, Brother, sister, uh, you need to repent. You need to handle this temptation the right way. And the person will turn to the preacher and say, Well, well, brother, you just don't understand what I'm going through. You just don't know the burden that I'm bearing. And the preacher says, You're not bearing any burden that hasn't been borne before by Christians. This is nothing new. Thousands, if not millions of Christians over the years have been uh, tempted by this same problem. And you're just another one. The question is not, is this a new temptation? Not, is this unique to me? The question is, are you going to find a way of escape and take a way of escape? Repent of your sin, overcome the temptation, and live faithfully to God. That's the main point that Paul makes here in reference to overcoming temptation. That uh, our temptations are not unique with us. God knows about them. He's provided a way of escape from them. Millions have faced the same temptation, and many have overcome. And our temptations today are no different than those that were uh, uh, afflicted the, the ancient Israelites in the Old Testament, or that afflicted the church in Corinth in the first century. Our temptations today are no different than theirs. But God always, as He did back in those days, provides a way of escape now, just as He did in the uh, to the Israelites and also to the Corinthians there in uh, the city of Corinth in the first century. We move on now to the issue of the divine order. This is the last one we'll have time to notice today. This uh, <clears throat> issue of the divine order that's spoken of in our uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, beginning 1 through 16. This particular issue, as we turn to chapter 11, 
we turn to a discussion of the divine order of God. What is the divine order of God when it comes to authority or the headship of God and Christ and man and woman? They apparently had a problem with this in Corinth. More than likely, there were women there who were tempted to disavow themselves of their subjection to man. They were trying to get rid of any of the uh, symbols of that subjection. They're in Corinth. And he addresses that. There's two aspects to this issue I want to point out. First one is the issue of the covering itself. And the second one, more expansive or more ubiquitous issue, is that of the divine order of God. And regardless of what the local situation or issue might be in a local church, we have to make sure that we understand the order that God has placed man in. The context there, he begins by pointing out in verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of man, or Christ, is God. And then he goes on to point out that some, that the, the sin of women praying uncovered. I want to be careful going through these points. I've written them down. I'm just basically going to read them for you. And you can read along with me in the bullet today. When he tells these people there, correcting their, the problem of these women that were disavowing themselves of their need to be in subjection to man and throwing away the covering that was a local custom in Corinth at the time, he is not teaching them that woman is inferior to man, nor is he denying the fact that in Christ there is neither male nor female. Those are true. Women are not inferior to men in reference to their spiritual uh, value or their way God looks upon them. And in Christ, it's true there is no male nor female. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. So it had apparently become the practice of some of the women in the Corinthian church to cast aside all the symbols of subjection to man. And that uh, symbol was the wearing of a covering, the wearing of a veil, as 1 Corinthians chapter 11 points out. So Paul seeks to correct that. And in the course of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, he makes several arguments to point out that the woman that at that time should wear a covering over her head. The first was that uh, man's headship over the woman. The second argument is to be uncovered was equal to be shaven, which was shameful. The third argument was because of the order of creation, that man was created first. Then fourthly, because of the angels. And I've never read a commentary who really understood what that particular argument entailed. Why well, doesn't mean that a woman should wear a covering over her head because of the angels, and then because of nature. So those are at least five arguments. Some people say there's six or seven arguments, where Paul points out that a woman should wear a covering over her head. Uh, a lot of disagreement has arisen over whether or not history supports the contention that the veil was a custom in Corinth. And I think Paul is asserting that it was. And that because it was a strong, long-held custom for women to wear a covering to show their subjection to man, that women should, in the church should do that. I don't believe that's a custom today. May not have been a custom any other place in the first century. Or at any other point in time that I'm aware of, but apparently it was in Corinth. Now, why do I say that it was probably a custom in Corinth? Well, there are certain words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that seem to indicate that it was a custom. If you take a look at the word judge among yourselves in verse 13, the idea of judging among yourselves, he's telling them to judge not based upon the word of God so much, but just on their own experience. Judge among yourselves. That seems to indicate that there is a 
a judgment that they have to make that's based upon, in this case, a custom that was uh, respected and uh, acknowledged by the entire community, by the entire city, particularly those who are Christian. And then uh, he says, is it comely or is it proper? In verse uh, 16, I believe. Uh, verse 13, judge among yourselves, is it proper, or the King James Version says comely, for a woman to pray to God with her head at cover. There's another reference there to what appears to be a, a custom. They were to ask themselves, is it proper, is it comely? That is, is it, is it something that uh, that uh, is fitting under the circumstances for you to uh, uh, wear a covering if you're a woman uh, to show your subjection to, to man. And then he uses the word nature in verse 16, and, or rather in verse 14. He says, not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. So he's basing his arguments on the woman having long hair, and that nature is one of the arguments he appeals to, to draw this conclusion. And then verse 16, he uses the word custom. So all these references you don't find in places normally where he's teaching what people need to do or not do as Christians. He doesn't use these phrases such as judge among yourselves or is it comely or nature, does not nature teach you? And the word custom in this context. I think all these seem to indicate that it was indeed a custom within the city of Corinth, and maybe other places as well, as I mentioned, we don't really know for sure, that the women were to wear a covering over their head when they prayed, prayed or prophesied, as the context indicates. So that's the issue, the immediate issue that they dealt with there, whether a woman should wear a covering. But the overall issue, the more important point, regardless of whether the covering was a local custom or not, is that God's order of headship is established, and God's order of headship must be revered and respected. And that's what he points out, I think, in his context. And God's order of authority and headship, as he points out there in verse uh, 3, where he says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. God, Christ, man, woman, is the order of headship that has been laid out from the very beginning. And there are many passages in the Word of God that point that out. Ephesians chapter 5 is one passage. And others as well that talk about Adam having been created first and then Eve or Eve sinning uh, before uh, first instead of Adam. So all these things play into the principle established in the Word of God of God's divine order of headship between God and the human family, involving both men and women. So those are the, some of the issues. We'll have one more lesson on this particular uh, series next week. We'll be talking about uh, two other issues that they face there. And again, the issue itself, maybe it was caused by an offense or a problem, but Paul emphasizes in all these areas, how are you dealing with these issues? Are you dealing and responding to them, reacting to them in a scriptural God-fearing way? And of course, as I mentioned also, at the beginning of all these lessons, these are temptations, these are issues, these are problems that not only plague the church in Corinth, but can plague and bother every group, every local group of God's people, no matter when or where they exist, including you and I today here in Chester. So let's look upon these series of lessons as individual lessons on all these points. Carnality within a local congregation. How are we dealing with that? Immorality. Contentions when they arise. How do we handle those? Marriage issues. Are we teaching the truth on marriage issues? and scriptural marriages, and divorce, and so forth. Christian liberty, are we handling our Christian liberties in a way that's showing 
and putting others first. Paying a preacher is not as much of a problem now as it may have been in the past, but it can be with uh, certain people and individuals and churches. In the divine order that we just talked about, all these can raise their ugly head and cause problems in any church of God's people, including the church here in Chester in the 21st century. Let's keep these thoughts in mind and consider the fact that every, any problem that a church might have, any experience with problems that we have, there is a scriptural solution for it. It involves respecting God, respecting His Word, the authority of His Word. It involves putting others first, making sure that we're keeping the unity and the peace of the congregation intact as we deal with one another, and make sure we have the right attitude of humility and not putting our own desires in front of those of others. Let's think about these things. If there's any among our number, they need to come forward this morning to become a child of God, to make your life right in any way. As a child of God, you fall away. You need the prayers of the church to bring you back into fellowship with Christ. We encourage you to come forward and take care of that problem now. As we get to stand and as we sing. Oh, 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 oh.